All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we will get started. We have a quorum. Um, and we'll start with, uh, first, I just would like someone, if anyone is willing to volunteer, sorry, I have the minutes up, I should pull up the agenda, um, volunteer to read the equity and land acknowledgement. Uh, if anyone is uh, willing to volunteer this week, would appreciate it. Yeah, I can get it. Thanks, Mike. Go for it. Um, so we as the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission want to begin this meeting by affirming BPAC's commitment to equity and racial justice. We would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on lands that have served as the home for diverse indigenous communities long before government, or I'm sorry, current governments were established here. We pay our respect to the elders and members of these communities, both past and present, and recognize the harms of genocide and colonialism. We will make a conscious effort to reflect on the following questions as we advance through our business and contemplate changes in our community. And we recognize that achieving equity requires our commitment to an ongoing process. How can we seek to repair harm with our work and not erase history? How does our work impact the vulnerability and safety of people who hold many intersecting marginalized identities, including black, indigenous, and people of color, people with disabilities, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning people? How can we prioritize and center people in our decision-making? How can we be more responsive to local needs? And how can our work build community power and shared decision-making? Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> I think uh, we read this every every month, and uh, but it's good to sort of reflect on it as well. I think we did a little bit of uh, some work the past month that I think was directly related to a couple of these questions uh, with regards to our meeting with the community folks in North Roxborough. So we'll get into that later, but um, <clears throat> it's good to keep this in mind. Um, we have a few new members. I'll stop sharing for a moment. Um, first of all, I guess we can go through any um, absences, excused or, or known, Hannah. Sure, so um, Javiera said she will not be attending. And then Brian Hawkins said that he might be able to attend. Um, so he might come in and out. Um, and then the only other person was Hannah, but she's here. So we're all good. Yeah, I'm here. And then Andreas will be joining us around 730. I know he's traveling home this evening. Um, so we're flipping schedules. As he comes in, I will be heading out. OK, thanks for letting us know. We won't be without a youth representative at any moment. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we have a few new members this month. So I'd like for us to give those new folks just a chance to introduce themselves. And then um, we can go around, maybe we can go around first. Just everyone can all sort of call out names. And th for those who have been on the commission already, just sort of say your name um, uh, and how long you've been on the commission. And then we'll I'll give it to our three new members to just introduce themselves briefly as well. Um, my name is Dennis Idemir. I've been on the commission over two years now. And um, yeah, and I've been the chair since uh, January. And uh, maybe Mary Rose, if you can. Hi, I'm Mary Rose. I am uh, the bicycle community representative for, on the county side. And I've been on the commission since August. Mm -hmm. Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Lee. I'm the Duke liaison. I've been on the commission since um, June. Mike Shepard. Mike Shepard. I've been on the commission a little over two years as well. Um, I am the secretary at the moment and working as the committee head with PI, which is a uh, plan implement implementation and evaluation committee. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention, yeah, that's a good, we should mention any committees that we're uh, participating in as well. Um, Suzanne, uh, Suzanne Schmall. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, Suzanne. I'm part of uh, BPAC. I've been part, I think now about five years and actually I think I'll, be rolling off in a little bit. I think I'm on here a little bit longer because of a uh, came midterm. So I should be rolling off pretty soon. <laughs> um, but I uh, was past chair, been part of triple E or education encouragement engagement for about uh, three and a half, four years now. And so, uh, yeah, that's good to see everybody here. Thanks. 
Thanks, Suzanne. Um, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Bakalchuk. I've been on uh, B. This is my second stint on BPAC. I was a commissioner from 2014 to 2016, and uh, I just rejoined. I think in May or June, uh, representing the city. I'm also a commissioner on the Open Space and Trails Commission, DOST, uh, representing the county, and it's my second stint on DOST. I served on DOST from 2010 to 2016. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Landon. Hey guys, I'm Landon Balkum. I've been on BPAC for a little over a year now, um, and I participate in the uh, DevRev committee. Landon, Hannah Preston. Hey, I'm Hannah Preston. I'm with the youth rep, and I'm also on Tripoli. I think I started in the summer. I don't remember which month, but it feels like it's gone by so quickly. So mm -hmm. happy to see everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Hannah. Scott Carter. Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Carter, and I've been on BPAC for coming up on a year and a half now, and I'm the chair of the Development Review Committee. And just a quick update on that, we review development plans submitted by developers and try to make sure that in their plans they um, adhere to uh, our goals of adding bicycle and pedestrian uh, facilities and features. So anyway, we will hear more about that in my report. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Marissa. Hey, hi, good evening. My name is Marissa Hartzler. Um, been on, I think, yeah, since the summer, August. Um, and um, I, uh, I'm on the Development Review Committee. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, Ed. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Rizzuto. I have been on BPAC since 2018. Um, I'm currently the vice chair and I uh, participate in the Tripoli committee meetings as well. Thanks, Ed. <clears throat> Ideal. Yeah, we're just introducing ourselves as you can tell. Hi, my name's Ideal Ortiz. I think I've been on BPAC like for five years, six years. Anywho, um, <laughs> I've been the secretary before, um, an honorary member of Tripoli. Thanks. Yeah, um, we have a bunch of new members this year and a few staples who have been around and know, know a little bit more maybe uh, experience with BPAC. Um, and, uh, I guess what oh yeah, Kristen, I wanna this is a good moment if you don't mind introducing yourself as well, and then we'll I'll take to the new BPAC members. Sure. Uh my name is Kristen Brookshire and I work with Durham Public Schools and I'll be talking about community transportation and safe routes to school tonight. Thank you. And uh yeah, so I'll pass it to our new members. Uh maybe we can start with uh Jack, if you wouldn't mind just a brief intro about uh your background and why you joined. Uh, my name is Jack O'Doherty. I uh, notice I'm logged into my wife's account, so I apologize for that. Um, I, I got it. I'm I'm retired and I'm a biker, and uh, I just thought I could see what I could do with this committee because, well, we'll go into it later. But I want to see what I can do. That's and great. Road rash. <laughs> road rash. You have the scars to prove it. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Royal? Evening, I'm Royal and I represent North Carolina Central University. New to the commission. Great. Thanks, Royal. Glad to have you. We've been looking forward to having a North Carolina Central representative for a while. And Suzanne Walensky, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, I'm Suzanne Walensky. <laughs> so new to um, BPAC also and um, I've been in the area for three years and um, I live in a community where there's a lot of development around. It's Durham County, but it's a Chapel Hill address. I don't understand that, never have. But um, there's a lot of development around and um, there's a lot of concern about all of that development and high rises and all kinds of things like that. So that's why I wanted to get involved to see 
what's going on for us bikes and pedestrians yeah thank you Sudan. glad to have you all um don't hesitate to ask questions if, if you have any we're all sort of learning here together um I see Heidi Carter joined us as well. Glad to have you. And Javiera, as Hannah mentioned, is not able to make it. Heidi, maybe you can just briefly sort of introduce yourself and your role. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Heidi Carter. I'm a county commissioner, and we are all appointed to 40 or so boards or commissions, and I'm lucky to be appointed to yours. I really well, appreciate your work. Thanks, Heidi. We're lucky to have you. All right. I will uh, move forward now. Any um, adjustments to the agenda uh, that was sent out earlier? Not seeing anything. I think, I don't know if there was a specific spot for it, but we'll discuss it with the meeting schedule for uh, the December meeting. Oh yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll discuss the December meeting date as well. Um, just FYI, but I don't see anything from folks. So uh, then the other, uh, Agenda item is to approve the minutes from October. Were there any adjustments to the uh, minutes from October? I can share that very quickly, actually. <clears throat> not seeing anything, not hearing anything. Um, if there are no adjustments, maybe we can get a motion to approve. This is uh, it, I'll to approve. approve. Nope. <laughs> Go ahead, Ed. Uh, Ed moves to approve the agenda and the minutes from October. I'll second it. This is Suzanne Schmall. Okay. Thanks. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes from October? Aye. Aye. Hearing, seeing eyes. All opposed? Mm -hmm. Not hearing or seeing anything. Okay, so the minutes from October are approved. Thanks, everyone. And uh, We'll leave a moment for public comments. I see just a couple of folks. I see Aspen, thanks for joining Aspen. And I see Leslie Tracy, thanks for joining. Um, feel free to leave in the Q&A if you have any specific comments you wanted to make during the public comment portion. Um, otherwise, uh, glad to have you in any case. Not seeing anything. Okay, great. By the way, Hannah. Reynolds, I didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself, but you've met everybody. Oh, May's joined us as well. Welcome, May. Um, if you have any public comments or questions, feel free to leave them in the Q&A, May, and we can address them um, later on in the meeting. Okay, I think that's all on our end. Um, waiting another moment for anything in the Q&A. Not seeing anything, okay. All right, Kristen, uh, thanks for joining us again. We're really glad to have you uh, again on a relatively sort of holiday adjacent week. So thanks for thanks for coming and, and taking your evening. Um, so I'll hand it off to you. Sure, um, I'll just forewarn that bedtime is still happening upstairs. So any thumps, bumps or cries, um, I'll try to endure. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we didn't test out screen share before. Let me see how this goes. I think you should be able to since you're a panelist. Yeah. I okay. Awesome. It looks good. We see it. Let's see. Do you see slides? Yes. Okay. See Thanks. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for inviting inviting me here tonight. Um I'm a little surprised or embarrassed it, it took this long i've been with the school district uh, a year and a half i have dipped into a few um, bpac meetings along the way um, but i'm happy to be here tonight to update you on um, the type of work that i do within durham public schools and more specifically safe routes to school uh within within durham so um let's see so this is these are a few pictures of um arrival and dismissal at, at some DPS schools. I think this is mostly what people think of when they think of school travel. Um, and I've, I've also 
<clears throat> always found it interesting that the exact moment that aerial imagery is taken at some of our schools, it captures the chaos of our current <laughs> designs and modal choice. Uh, you'll see Hill and Dale and uh, Eno Valley on the screen. There are others uh, that have been captured at, at various points um, along the way, but the, the goal is really that school transportation looks more like what you see on the screen now. Um, you know, we'll always, you'll see in the upper right, we'll always have people driving to school. We'll always have students coming um, on school buses, but we really want to make sure that walking and biking is always a part of the conversation um, and that it's something that our families feel uh, comfortable and safe choosing when possible. <clears throat> Um, I'll leave this slide on really quickly. I This is the group that I do not have to talk about all the benefits of walking and biking and active travel, but being within the school district, something that really resonates when I'm talking with colleagues uh, in academic services is about benefits for learning and attendance and, you know, the... <clears throat> you know, starting the school day with a little bit of physical activity and that what that means for um, students and their their learning and what they're working for in terms of um, achieving their academic goals. Um, this is a fairly, it's, it's aging, but we, everyone still uses it. I love, you know, this has just been such a helpful infographic for more conversations than I could count. Um, just a good, good way to open the door with, with some folks that are like, why, why are we not talking about curriculum or, you know, the brackets of the day, how kids are getting to school and how they're leaving. And even physical activity during the day, it's relevant for, for PE. Um, so one more piece of background that I like to, to remind everybody of is that school traffic is really a self-reinforcing problem. Um, there's some statistics on the screen. Uh, this is all national data. So school travel by a family vehicle for students K-12 accounts for 10% of all vehicle trips during that peak period. And I, uh, the second bullet I like to call out because I, a lot of people think that, um, I hear it a lot, that you know people are dropping their kids off on the way to school. And that is true, but it is not, there are a lot of people that make return trips. They, I see it in my neighborhood. I've seen it around school, when I've been at other, at schools in the morning, they are going into the school and then going back home for a variety of reasons, but they're not all trip chaining, you know, drop kids off on the, on your way to work, on the way to shopping. Some of these are standalone trips. Um, so that was 49% or 40% looking at um, 2009 National Household Travel Survey data. And then this last one, I feel, I, I'm assuming that it feels largely true for Durham, but this point is something that is definitely worth exploring more locally, um, what are the factors? What what do people see as the barriers? I think, you know, 55% of parents nationally saying that, you know, the number of cars along the route to school is is a big issue for them, but it's, you know, you know, how much time do you have? Weather, concerns about personal safety. There's a, there's a ton of different things that we could dig into. So national data is interesting, but on this point, I think local data is, is, is most important. So a little bit about where I'm, where I fit in within Durham Public Schools and where Safe Routes to School fits in. Um, my unit that I'm based in is called School Planning and Operational Services. And so I'm kind of wedged between planning, which is the blue <laughs> part of this, this triangle and transportation. And that's kind of where Safe Routes to School fits as well. Um, I do work a lot in within school planning um, and some of the functions are listed there, but broad strokes, um, once we learn about that, the vision that our academic colleagues have for academic programs, what type of programs they need, whether it's art, music, DLI, you know, a new type of exceptional children's program, pre-K, um, we start planning for those programs spatially. So planning is really the very small team within DPS that is applying a spatial lens to um, these education topics. So what does it mean within the classroom? What does that classroom need to support that program? Uh, 
and then within the school, what does that mean for how space is used within the school? And then across the, the region of the county and then across the whole district, what does that mean for geographic diversity um, and transportation access? And then it's also about the students. So um, how many students do we forecast for next year? How many for 10 years from now? And where do they live? And so our support for the Office for Student Assignment is also about um, analyzing the data and looking at the choices that families are making and which application programs, are they transfer students? Are they choosing to go to their base school? Um, so our unit, so that's what planning does. And then with transportation and food on there, you know, the, they're largely responsible for the everyday service delivery, like yellow school bus and school meals. But what's really unique about our, our approach to transportation and school food is that we also have staff that are focused on the upstream and downstream of that, that service de delivery, what is affecting the choices that our families and students are making in terms of transportation and school meals. And so I have a, a counterpart who does food systems planning as well. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about you know where I fit in with what are traditionally thought of as like <clears throat> what school districts normally work on and normally do. Um, and so the that little wedge in between planning and transportation, we call that community transportation. Um, that's all the other modes except the yellow school bus. That doesn't mean that I don't work really closely with my colleagues in the who work on the yellow school bus. Um, I don't do student assignment to routes or hiring bus drivers, but I am working with my colleagues when it's about um, bus stop assignment or bus stop locations within neighborhoods, pedestrian safety around bus stop locations and, and, and other topics as well. So in my realm of community transportation, that involves coordinating with the city, county and state on MPO and, and, and the MPO. And that could mean, um, projects that, that DPS has identified a need for. Like we would like to have a crosswalk at Lions Farm Elementary, or we would like to talk about how we can reposition some of the transit stops near New Northern High School. And those are things that we might come to the table for. And then there's a lot of things that the city and county, city, county, state MPO might come to us for, you know, I'm, some of these projects have probably come through um, development review or some, you know, some of your other committee meetings, like, you know, Woodcroft Parkway extension is going to extend to Jordan High School. That's something that I can help with. Um, the intersection near Oak Grove, NCDOT is going to re redesign the intersection near Oak Grove Elementary. That is another entry point for me to weigh in and advocate, um, apply my transportation safety lens and advocate for what um, our students, staff, and families um, need, whatever the project may be. Um, I'm also the main contact for um, anything that has to do with school zone flashers and for the crossing guard program with the Durham Police Department. And so um, I also collaborate with Durham Public Schools Building Services. So that is new construction projects, renovation projects, and maintenance, pro maintenance projects. And um, let me see if I can move the zoom so I can see this a little better. Sorry. Uh, um, Oh, and arrival and dismissal best practices. So advising schools on best practices for some of these modal conflicts that occur on our site. Sometimes it's the school that calls me out to provide some assistance. And sometimes it is a, a community partner, maybe even the city saying, oh, we've got something going on here. Um, how can we take a look at this? And I think with working with building services and the Point about arrival and dismissal. Um, what what I'm bringing is a bigger toolbox. I think in the past, you know, it might be well, how can we get an officer out there, or well, let's put up a sign. Thinking about it, a uh, bigger picture: is there a policy or procedure reason this is happening? Is there an infrastructure improvement that can address the the problem that we're seeing or the problem that we're observing? Um, and so. That, you know, that's sometimes it is just a sign and sometimes it is redesigning the, the flow at the school or or it is, you know, a medium or long term infrastructure project that we're um, zeroing in on uh, transportation data collection. So we do a, a monthly travel tally, just show of hands 
within classrooms that teachers collect. How do you get to school today? How do you plan to leave school today? Um, our data is much more robust at the elementary level, I will say. Um, we are working on getting better data at the middle and high school level. Uh, site access and easement requests. So anytime a developer uh, or landowner needs something from us, anytime we need something internally, we need an easement or some type of um, site access that, that goes through me and our office as well. Um, and then safe routes to school, which uh, is the best thing to know. My favorite thing to, to work on. <laughs> um, out of the list. I mean, all of these are very interesting, um, you know, challenging, you know, we have to think creatively, but yeah, safe routes to school. That's where I get out, um, out to the schools and get to, you know, yeah, I'll talk about that just, yeah, a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, this is recorded. I can say it's my favorite. You're allowed to say that. Um, let's see. Okay. And so some of those topics that I just hit on, I realized uh, one way to kind of summarize how these things intersect is to think about uh, Marie Massenburg Elementary, which is the new elementary school that's opening in 24, 25. Uh, you'll see the, the parcel is highlighted there on the map at South Roxborough and Martin Luther King. Um, so there's really three different this program, this school was already fully designed when I came in. So weighing in on site circulation and or anything like that was already fully baked. But there's there's still been a lot of opportunity for me to engage in this project. Um, we, in terms of easements and site access, when we received an easement request from the developer um, adjacent to us on Cook Road, they needed access for sewer. Um, I think you know, without a transportation lens, someone at the table thinking about, mm, is there something we need along Cook Road that might be helpful uh, on their parcel? We might have just paid, you know, whatever the might have asked for the amount of money that 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 part of our property access to that part of the property was worth. Um, Dale McKeel had actually planted a seed before this developer had reached out and was like, oh, it'd be really nice if we could get a path to Cook Road so that kids didn't have to go all the way around to Juliet or up Martin Luther King to South Roxboro. And I had that in the back of my head. And so when the developer asked um, about an easement, we negotiated a swap. It took a long time. Uh, DPS board approved it in September, uh, but they granted us access you'll see it looks like we touch cook road but we don't if i zoomed in too far you would you'd lose the context um but we have access for a pedestrian right of way on their property and they are building a sidewalk which they weren't required to do but it will connect to another small part um so that's something that's really forward looking you know we have to open the school we're not going to mess with the site plan now but we have that easement ready for a future project to build a path in the back of the school so that we have improved uh, pedestrian access. Otherwise it's a mile, it would be a mile around to the front door. Um, and then within the building, working with our colleagues in academic services on, you know, placement for pre-K program, exceptional children's program, um, what that means for those classrooms and what it means for regional access, like how many, which type of program, uh, what, you know, what types of features do those individual classrooms need all the way down to the top furniture. Um, and then coming out to South Roxboro, being at the table with our construction and, and capital planning team and the city, we, we're having monthly meetings to review the requirements that city of Durham required for South Roxboro um, and making sure that the timing of the projects lines up. We have unfortunately opened our last couple of schools with, um, transportation improvements still in progress. So we are really working together to make sure that we can open uh, Marie Massenburg in August of 2024 with a uh, signal crosswalk, pedestrian signals, everything that that we need to make sure students living on the other side can can access the school without having, they don't have to choose to, to drive or take the school bus. Um, so that's how some of those factors all come together. Um, in one of our, what will be our new school next year.
So I realized with this group, I also don't have to give a big overview of all the E's that, you know, Safe Routes to School, but broadly, I like to to remind us that, you know, the goals of Safe Routes to School are to make walking and bicycling, um, <clears throat> make it safe to get to school and to encourage more families to to choose to, to um, walk and bike to school when they can. And so, um, and then a little bit bigger picture from that, you know, that safe walking and biking are important life skills that students can take with them regardless of where they currently live and go to school. And so that's where the programming piece comes comes into play because not everybody will be able to walk and bike to school. Um, and so learning at their school, something that they can take with them, you know, maybe it's middle school, maybe it's college, maybe it's their first job, but planting those seeds um, and making sure that they have practice. So I have, um, little recap of what Safe Routes to School has looked like uh, within Durham and what where we are at now and then what we're what we're moving toward. So um, we have biweekly coordination meetings with with Bike Durham uh, School District, City of Durham, and Durham County. Um, Hannah's always in those meetings with us. Um, be someone else on here. Sorry, at least Hannah um, and. I will make a plug for a recent blog post from Bike Durham. I think for their 10th anniversary, they they did a good job um, documenting the origins of Safe Routes to School within Durham County. So this obviously way predates me. Uh, it probably does not predate everyone on here. Some of it will probably be very familiar, but I think it's a nice recap. I didn't want to pull it all into a slide, but if you haven't read that, um, go ahead and take a look on their blog. Um, but right now, what Safe Routes to School means what that encompasses is our elementary bicycle safety education classes that Bike Durham provides. Um, recent, so we have two, two fleets of bikes that move around. So at any given time, two elementary schools are receiving the bike safety education classes. And this school year, we've added a fleet of balance bikes so that our kindergartners are getting on the bike and getting some practice. Uh, and then we're also working to add some more pedestrian safety content. It's been pretty focused on on bike safety and we're looking at different ways to incorpor in, uh, incorporate more pedestrian safety content. Um, school celebration events, these are a great chance to showcase lessons that students learn during bike safety class. Mostly um, they're hosted on the weekend and parents are invited, uh, but we have a couple recent examples where we've done it during the school day. Uh, and just one was just, um, yesterday, Tuesday, yesterday, just yesterday at Arn Harris, where we did it during the school day and students, every student got to participate, even if they didn't do the bike safety education class this time, but it was during their specials period. So it was, you know, like music and art and PE teachers coming together to, to bring their kids out for different, um, different stations. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and then our walk, bike and roll the school day events. So those happen in October each year and in May, we have schools that do on-campus activities and some that do off-campus activities like meet at one point, walk together, bike together to school. Uh, these are a lot of fun and I think it's a great way to <clears throat> raise visibility within and the classes too. I mean, these, these really public facing activities uh, and events are important. Um, to keep safe routes to school. I think it keeps us in, in conversation, even when there's things that we are working on that are not as shiny or take a lot longer to, to get through the pipeline. Um, I think that these things are foundations that build momentum within the community. And this is definitely something that we'll be continuing to do. Um, and a, a lot of this, I mean, this is all led by Bike Durham in coordination with Durham Public Schools. Uh, in the past, it was recent past, it was uh, a grant that the city was hosting from NCDOT. Right now they have some uh, grant funding through the county. And then we're transitioning to this next round of NCDOT grant funding that is going to be based with Durham Public Schools. So they're, they've been putting together different um, funding sources to make this happen. And I think probably some donor um, funds have made some additions on top of you know, standard programming. 
So moving forward with this next round of the NCDOT grant that we won um, in the spring, definitely continued support for classes and encouragement events. Um, we're looking at curriculum integration and, and ways to elevate student voice. Um, with this next round of the grant, middle school and high school, mid, I guess middle school is always eligible, high school is not eligible. So now going all the way up to 12th grade, um, is is an eligible activity. So um, looking at in school or after school activities that are focused on for these older students, um, activities that are focused on uh, the connections between bicycle and pedestrian safety and health and the environment. Um, and we really wanna make sure uh, that we're aligning, there's definitely going to be a listening and learning phase here because we want to make sure that um, whatever we are offering is something that students are interested in and that it aligns with their their personal interests and their educational interests. So um, that is, you know, I'm really excited that we're able to to start working with with older students and educators who work with older students. Um, some additional tasks include hands-on support for everyday trip planning. Um, and I, these, I'm listing this out. We definitely will have time at the end. I want to hear some of your ideas and questions, um, your leads, any, any wonderings that you have. Um, so supporting families in, in planning their everyday trips, um, kind of like a technical assistance that could be coming out to school events setting up a table. It could be something that we do online. There's a variety of different ways that we could um, share that information and learn. P there might be just a small question that people have that that's the barrier, or it might be something bigger and maybe it helps us understand like something else that we can be focusing our attention on to whatever that barrier is to, to making that trip. Um, we want to document what, what are the common walking and biking routes? What are families choosing now that that those kind of go together, we'll eventually be able to make um, maps that we could share share out, but documenting those common routes um, and transit access points for all of our schools. Um, we would just call them common. We wouldn't really want to put a stamp on them that says safe because that's still for families to decide what works best for them. Um, if you have a better term than common walking routes, <laughs> we'll accept that as well. Uh, to, we also want to inventory transportation facility gaps near our schools and school facility improvements. So actually on our sites um, in terms of pedestrian access, um, bicycle parking, anything that DPS can change ourselves, uh, we wanna have a really good handle on that for our, our maintenance and capital planning um, process. And then um, a survey at it could be at the school level or at the district level, but this would be um, gathering information about perceptions. It's something we definitely would like to have a baseline and be able to document change over time. Um, this will, many of these things will hopefully be possible with hiring up to two um, positions that are funded by the grant. One would be an educator position that's some of the first few bullets. And then a planner position would be the next few bullets on the slide. Um, but it's definitely flexible depending on who we find. Those positions were posted in October and we're starting interviews next week. Some of these are things that are part of my job now. Some of them are things I've never been able to get to, um, but it's a wish list. but I think we can do a lot of this. Uh, and then I think I had to make it, the next bullet is on the next slide. So a uh, crossing guard location evaluation is another grant funded task um, that we want to start soon. So <clears throat> this is important given change over time. Um, as far as we know, the crossing guard locations within Durham have been the same at least since 2014. I've never seen a list. We have not been able to find anything from before that time. Maybe anybody on the, the call today has some uh, historical knowledge that we can layer in here. Um, but, you know, someone mentioned new developments, you know, new developments are coming in, transportation infrastructure changes, um, student populations change, uh, but we are also inducing some change in our new school boundaries that will be going into effect with the 24-25 school year. 
Um, Durham Public Schools did a re big redistricting project called Growing Together. Um, and next school year is when the elementary boundaries um, will, will take place. So I've just listed on the screen the current crossing guard locations, uh, just, you know, as background information, but um, this is definitely something that we want to do. This will take um, coordination with the city transportation department and the Durham police department. Um, and I think that that triangle of school district transportation and police department is really important. I've done a lot of, a lot of searching about how other um, communities and districts across, you know, in North Carolina and across the country handle their crossing guard programs. And it seems, it makes sense, but it seems like it's best when the, at least those three parties are at the table. Um, because like I mentioned earlier about having that bigger toolbox, you know, if there's a problem at a crosswalk, a police officer is going to interpret, maybe have a different solution than the transportation engineer and the school district person is also going to have some background information. So I think it's a conversation between those three parties. So um, we would like to have that done, obviously, before the beginning of the next school year. This is just assuming um, status quo, like we have no reason to believe anything with um, funding for the crossing guard program is going to change, go up or down, but we just want to be able to capture that baseline data and understand what the priority list would be. What would, if we could do more schools, what would the next, what would the next schools be? Or are some of these locations, you know, do we need to change some of them given their new school boundaries? Um, and I think the answer is yes for at least a couple, but um, it needs to be a bigger conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> um, all right. That is, that is what I had um, for tonight. I definitely would like to hear from those those on the call if you are inspired or concerned or you know curious if there's anything. I see a, a hand just went up, um, and it doesn't just have to be tonight. I take what you give tonight, and then you can find me. You know, email me, call me. I'm I'm here to to learn from what you want to offer. And then lastly, I will just share. This is what my five-year-old thinks I do all day. Um, and so this is my job as a transportation planner. And you will see I'm holding a pen and everybody's writing. I'm holding a pen, writing on my clipboard, and everybody's wearing their helmet on their scooter, their bike, or their stroller or wagon. So I just look back at that when I'm having a if I'm having a hard day. Thank you, Kristen. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think I'm sure we all talk about uh, safe routes to school pretty frequently here. So, and it's really great to have you um, join us. And I think Jeff has a question. I'm sure we'll have a bunch of questions, but I just wanted one quick thing. At the beginning, you talked about the cognitive benefits of walking. And it's just something that, like, you know, sometimes, you know, we think about these things. But it's just I hadn't pieced that together specifically how valuable that could be for uh, for students um, and like the uh, how much that could impact the educational experience as well. But it's just sort of, yeah, all the things that a lot of the folks here already know, but uh, it's good to hear it again and, and hear it in more detail. Um, Jeff, we'll throw it to you. Thank you. Uh, first, Kristen, thank you so much for coming here. It's great to see, um, you know, advocacy for this. I know that. Um, you have a planning and transportation director in Matthew Palmer, who's really committed to this. He's actually a former BPAC member. So, so I know the um, the commitments there. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, you mentioned transit. And one thing that I've never seen, um, I have a son in middle school, is, is the schools giving out information about public transit as an option. I say that because my seven year, my seventh grader who goes to Lakewood Montessori actually rides Go Durham to and from school because it's actually quicker than the school bus route. Now we happen to be in a, in a great location that works for his school yeah. in our house, but I just always have thought that there's probably a lot of parents who don't even know that that's an option and possibly also reaching out to the staff at Go Durham, um, you know, to, I don't know how to phrase this, to, to kind of watch out for the kids. And uh, like my son had some delays on a couple of 
bus routes, and I spoke to the um, public, um, the um, service manager at Go Durham, and he was like, "Well, you know, here's my information. If he ever, you know, misses his connection, have him, you know, see me. I'm usually there at that time. So, you know, they have staff that, um, you know, can mm -hmm. help the kids because I'm sure it might be intimidating. My son's ridden Go Durham with me since he's like four, so he's comfortable with it. But I know a lot of kids might not be." And maybe an opportunity to partner with Go Durham to get, you know, parents and kids more comfortable with that as an option. I love that you said that. It That's probably some of our best transit access. I mean, that's a frequent bus line right there in front of, of Lakewood. And the right. you need to tell your principal that your son rides Go Durham he, because he knows he's that. told me that nobody does and that they wouldn't. And so I think, you know, I, I would love to talk more with you about how we can sure. kind of raise raise the profile within within Lakewood because I'm 100% sure that it is faster for him than the school bus because Lakewood is a district wide program too so right. having a smaller school with district wide bus service is hard um and so and, and I could tell I don't know the last time you had a conversation with Mr. Jones um but I know he knows my week. son takes um takes the bus there um, okay. Because one thing they've worked with him is he leaves class uh, about five minutes before the end of the day, because then he can catch a bus and save mm -hmm. a half hour on his trip and not, you know, just miss the bus. So, um, you know, they're willing to work with kids. Um, I just think there's an opportunity um, in terms of educating parents that this is a viable option for some people. Yep, I do, too. Um, yep. Thank you for that comment. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about why do so many parents drive their kids to school and not take the bus? Does the do the school buses not go to everybody? Because when I grew up, I had to walk a half a mile to my bus stop, but there was my mom was never gonna take me to, to school. So I had to take the bus every day. So I just I'm one, I'm jealous that so many people get driven to school, but also why are so many people driving to school? There are a lot of different answers for that. Um, I will say Durham is kind of unique in that everyone can ride the bus, um, you know, legally or from the North Carolina legislature, really, if a district provides school bus transportation, they're only required to do it for students that live 1.5 miles from their school. So we do often encounter counterparts within the state that are like, you bus who and where? How? So you can, I mean, it is available, but I think Families choose to drive for a variety of different reasons. Um, if anybody on in the call wants to share something that comes to mind, I don't think there's one answer um, for that, though. I I know that, you know, I don't have children, but part of the reason that I would likely drive my children to school um, if I had them is that I suffered quite a bit of physical and sexual harassment mm -hmm. and abuse every day for an hour on a bus to a magnet school going and going to school and coming back. So that is how I started my day and how I ended my day every day with bruises in school because of the children on the bus and my elderly bus driver did not feel like he could intervene. So there's no chance in hell I would put a kid on a bus. That's an important perspective. I, I'm, Kristen, were you saying that, sorry, in Durham, all, or what is the requirement for how many students must be uh, for a, you know, a, given a bus? If a school district in the state of North Carolina, if a school district provides bus transportation, they have to provide it for families, for students who live 1.5 miles from their school. And Durham is just meets that minimum. No, no, no. We'll no. We we don't. There's no cut. There's no cut off. I I, I, see, I see. Which is also a strain on the transport. I mean, it, there's there's pros yeah. and cons to that. I mean, there's a, a variety of different ways to to um, explain that as well. Yeah, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't have any answers. I mean, I think like Kristen said, there's a lot of reasons for why people don't ride the bus and 
one being what ideal said and i think also perceptions of safety in a variety of ways on buses by students and families um and and honestly the time commitment too i think some students you know they can get a direct ride in a lot shorter time than if they take the bus so i mean that's another reason yeah um yeah it it meant that i had to i had to get up at 4 30 in the morning to make my bus on time to my magnet school so given the developmental needs of people at a particular age you'd be losing anywhere from one to three hours of extra sleep that the developing brain needs. And I think some parents just make the choice that that's more important than putting them on a free bus. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I did have a question. I saw in your slide something about surveying the schools and districts as part of the upcoming plan. I know we had some family members um, from the Hope Valley Elementary School area on here a while back. And I know that they were interested in um, access, like they wanted to walk, but it just felt so dangerous. And so is that something you're going to be able to help schools with as part of being kind of in partnership with transportation planning and and the school systems? Like, is that something? Um, and if so, like, how can this group help with that? Because I think that is a huge issue. I think people who do live within walking distance would like to walk, but uh, the Mossdale Street areas, they're like, it's it's crazy. You know, it's crazy to even try in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Hope Valley is interesting. I think it summarizes a few different transportation challenges in that we have a, a lot of students that live just across a uh, university in the colonial townhomes along Chapel Hill Road. It takes three buses to just drive through the intersection to get to Hope Valley. Um, and then you've got, I, I, I look, I've got the map pictured, you know, not having sidewalks on Dixon is a huge barrier. The city is well aware of the, I mean, I think the city received constantly receives requests for sidewalks along Dixon and then crossing the other the road on the other side of the neighborhood that is right south of the school. Um, that's a higher higher volume cars are going higher speed but none of those residential neighborhoods have sidewalks and it's this can't put a crosswalk until you have sidewalk it's it's this loop that i have not i don't know how to get out of that that loop i'm well aware i think once you're if you're in a neighborhood that's right south of of the school there there are some cut throughs in the neighborhood i think i talked to the parent that came to this meeting i talked to her for over an hour i can't remember her name we had a great conversation we talked about you know some properties that people are able to get between but it's informal if somebody moves you know that if <clears throat> since that doesn't touch the school that's a harder that's a little bit harder for me to get involved in like advising on how you might get an easement or some other agreement with that property owner um, but at least that that path off of Ithaca Street is that informal connection that goes right into the school. That's a, you know, that's a pretty commonly used access point. Um, but yeah, you know, Hope Valley, that's kind of in this middle tier of schools. I think our we have 31 elementary schools. We'll have 32 when Murray Massenburg opens. There's like one, about one third of the schools are walkable. We have a lot of walkers. There's pretty good infrastructure. Uh, I shouldn't say all, not all of them have a lot of walkers, um, but there's a, and then there's a middle tier where like some people are walking. It's really just like one to 4% of, of students um, are walking to school. There's some major infrastructure barriers, but it's possible. And then there's another tranche where like it is huge infrastructure barriers. It's, you know, gonna would be a very long time until a school like that was walkable thinking about um, like Glen or Oak Grove, Mangum, you know, they're just out there and there's, it's, it's related to the land use pattern as well. But, um, but yeah, Hope Valley is definitely in that middle one, uh, that middle group. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Landon. Uh, speaking of those tiers, where would you classify Fayetteville street elementary? And some of the some of the schools are in and around that area. So Fayetteville Street, I would say, is in that first group of schools. Um, they have a crossing guard. There's a small. It's a very small school. There's a small but mighty group of families that I, I live literally across. I can see it from my front porch. Like okay, okay, directly across the street from it. 
Um, so that then gets in, and I know that there are, there's high schools and elementary schools all within walking and biking distance here. Although, um, and I know that you had said in, earlier in your presentation I, that you were that you were going to work with the North Carolina Department of Transportation um, and to secure grant funding to see how you can ad further advance this safe route to schools program. Uh, Fatal Street is a North Carolina Department of Transportation owned road, one that it is very fast, especially on this long stretch of straight road right in front of element of Fayetteville Street where there is a crossing guard. I'm talking people peeling out through there. Is there any focus? I know that there is, as this group has experienced in speaking with people who work at that department, is there any um uh, is there any inclination or any um, motivation in, or in, is it even, does it even cross the, is it even within scope of this safe routes to schools program to apply any sort of pressure to um, departments like that who do well and do have the power to, you know, make it to where, um, you know, the schools that are in that tier one really are, um, uh, are, are made more attractive by, you know, creating infrastructure changes or or anything that would make it because, you know, quite frankly, walking up and down Fayetteville streets, especially in the stretches, I'm aware not the most um, uh, attractive options for some people. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, so Fayetteville Street, another interesting thing about Fayetteville Street is that with the new boundaries, um, I hear you about it not being comfortable walking along Fayetteville Street. Or biking. The way, or biking, yeah. Um, but the way that the new boundaries are drawn, the school boundary, the school, you actually would not cross, if you were within the attendance zone for Fayetteville Street, you actually would not cross Fayetteville Street. That would be the, that's the edge of their, their boundary. We did look at 35 mile an hour roads in, in, as one of the many factors when we are designing the, we call them neighborhood planning units, but the geographies that we use to build out the school boundaries. Um, but yet, I mean, the short answer is that yes, it is completely within the bounds of my position and future positions to work with NCDOT um, on infrastructure improvements, identifying them, um, and we, I mean, that would of course be in coordination with the city too. Um, there are certain things, there are some projects where I've, it's been directly with NCDOT and other topics where it's been, you know, the city's at the table too, uh, just depending on what phase it's in. But um, I will say we have secured the NCDOT grant. So we applied last year and we did win the Safe Routes to School funding. Um, that's what we found out about in the spring and we're under contract as of this fall. Um, and so that's a go. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. I guess one thing I'll throw in is, yeah, if you're ever trying to make the case to NCDOT about reducing car speeds or making walking and biking safer, <laughs> we're doing that like every other month. So feel free to come and ask us to help if we can, you know, um, uh, so we have a couple more questions, and then we'll try to wrap it up from there. Uh, Mary Rose, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have sort of two questions, um, and one kind of goes into why kids or why parents might not want kids taking the bus. Um, and one of the schools that I went to, I I didn't really ever take the bus in the morning, but I often took the bus in the afternoon. Um, and one of the schools I went to had like a hub system where we had to take a bus to a central location like all the buses went there and then we switched buses and then they all spread out um and that process took forever and i, I have no idea why they did it that way um but it i mean i eventually like i stopped taking the bus home from that school specifically like my sister came and picked me up instead because it was taking like an hour longer and i only lived like 10 minutes drive from the school um, mm -hmm. and this was an hour longer than it was already. Um, and so that, could, I don't know if Durham does anything like that, but at least in other places, that could be a reason to not 
take the bus. Um, we still have uh, that type of hub service for some of the high school, some of the like CTE programs. Like it sounds like you lived really close. I mean, usually this means like you're not going to your base assigned school. Like I live in Jordan's yeah, was, zone, but I really want to do this program at Northern kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. The school I went to was a magnet school specifically, and it was in Gilbert County, but yeah. Um, yeah, so it wasn't like, it was still a public school, but not a traditional public school. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a school districts, yeah, there's hub stops, there's express busing, but that means that you're responsible to get to a location and maybe your parent drives you to that spot and then you take a bus. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's hard when you're trying to offer these choice programs and it's district wide in a big district. Um, it's not perfect, but I hear you. That is a huge, huge challenge. Um, and then I I had a question and I, I don't know if this has happened with a lot of schools in Durham, but I've heard from other places where um, like for elementary schools, they are discouraging students from walking um, due to like safety concerns for students walking to school at that young of an age. And I don't know if that's, uh, I mean, that just tells me that this infrastructure to get to the school is not safe and not not so much that the kids couldn't do it but um I don't know if that's a hurdle that you've um uh, encountered while doing like the safe walks to or safe routes to school or anything like that where like the school itself doesn't want people walking there's often a variety I, I, I would say not in any big in any big way I did have some experiences like that when I was working with schools in Wake County um, usually there's something else going on. Like it, it might be an admit a site level decision. Like the principal is trying to figure out what to do about people parking and walking. And maybe there there's, there's a variety of factors that could lead to something like that. I haven't, um, I'm aware, I'm aware of it. And I might, I kind of have my ears, like I would know some of the questions to ask and what I might be looking for if I heard something like that, um, bubble up, but not, not in a, a, a large scale. Okay. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. Oh, actually, and I'll mention Aspen had his question in the Q and A. Uh, I'll, oh. I'll say that after yours, Scott. Oh, okay. but I'll say it out loud. <clears throat> yeah. Hi. Um, we evaluated or reviewed new Northern high school, I don't know, in the, a year ago, and it seemed like it had a number of challenges related to biking and walkability. And I don't remember them specifically, but just wondering if you participate in that or you're aware of it, or if there was, you know, just there, there was nothing more that could be done or, you know, just uh, any kind of comments about what happened there. Um, I was kind of after the boat on Northern as well. Um, I was very aware of some of the concerns um, from the community to the north about the, the access point into the, the old farm neighborhood. That's a lot of the public comments that I heard about after I started. Um, it's tough because the, or one thing that is challenging is that, you know, the school was school district was not required to put in sidewalks along the front because it doesn't connect to sidewalks on either side north or south but we did but that still is you everyone still sees disconnected sidewalks so that's you know that's pretty i don't know what the right answer on that is of course we we can't keep extending them in either direction uh, you know beyond our our property but um i think that timing of, you know, the school, there was a lot of um, issues at the end trying to get the school open and the fact that it opened without the transportation improvements complete. I mean, they're still paving the road and the sidewalk wasn't done and there wasn't a curb ramp on the other side. And so that made for a really rough start. And then um, I've worked a lot with um, Jenny Green with the city of Durham mobility services about um, you know, looking at how we can communicate to the school about what the best 
all these phases, like what, what's the best thing to do about transit access now? What can we improve in the short term? What can we improve in the long term? We built a bus stop pad on the school side, but that didn't, you know, there's no changes made on the other side of the road to mirror, you know, with the school coming in. So there were some timing issues there as well. Um, but it's also just a really big, busy road. Um, but when you're looking to site a high school, I, my understanding is there's only a few parcels that were even under consideration before DPS bought that site. But, you know, <clears throat> it's some definitely some trade-offs there between, you know, access and then so much access when you're on a giant road like that. So. Great. Thank you. I mean, it yeah. sounds like you're definitely aware of it. And if there are any ways we can help with improving it over time, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes a little tough once everything's already on the ground to go back and try to retrofit things, but um, it still seems like maybe there's more that can be done. So anyway. I yeah, just... I agree. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll read Aspen's question real quick. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Kristen. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. We also have a couple questions from May, but they're um, not relevant to this presentation, so I'll bring okay. them up uh, at a later point. But Aspen says, hi, Kristen. I'm curious how DPS is thinking about transportation improvements related to the new redistricting plan. With more neighborhood-based schools, there's more potential for walking and biking than before, but still some big barriers to safety, especially letting your kid walk there by themselves. I live in Colonial Village and our new base elementary is Club Boulevard, but we have to cross Roxborough at Lavender. Are you working with NCDOT to give thought to changing the timing of the crossing lights in the morning and or having a crossing guard there and at similar schools with a big scary road nearby? Is this Aspen that I went to grad school with or is there another Aspen in Durham? Aspen Romaine, I believe, unless it is a surprising Aspen, but... Okay. Um... Probably. <laughs> I think so. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I'm noting down that location specifically. Um, the timing of the signal. I mean, the crossing guard question, that is definitely part of, I um, have to look how far that is from the school. I mean, I wish I have not found a place nationally, I mean, crossing guards are usually so close to the school. And sometimes those are not the areas of that wouldn't be my area of highest concern. I mean, usually crossing guards are one block, maybe two blocks from the school. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, Club Boulevard is, would be included in our crossing guard location evaluation study, especially because they already have a crossing guard at that school. We are looking at a few more schools that don't currently have a crossing guard. Um, it is high Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the direction from which people are traveling, sometimes there's a big change for the school. And in some cases, it's just small changes on one side of the, the boundary, but it's, it might be new families coming in. So even if there's the infrastructure changes, but then there's also like the, the community, um, you know, the, culture around walking and biking and how to to help a family maybe consider that if they if that wasn't an opportunity for them previously um so yeah we're i'm very attuned to um what this what these new boundaries will mean for um changing travel patterns and you know the opportunity for big infrastructure changes you know maybe not, but there might be some low-hanging fruit projects that we can identify. Um, Hannah and I have worked together on a few recently. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, um, but thank you for bringing up that specific example. Um, I made note of that. Yeah. Does that, um, to, to um, Aspen's question, like, is it in your scope, I guess, to change, uh, to work with DOT? Like is DOT, NCDOT going to be willing to change like signal timing and things like that near schools is that something that comes up in conversation or is that uh, i think the city process? does the signal timing i don't know mm -hmm. that ncdot does uh, but signal timing i mean i'm also not a oh hannah were you going to chime in on that we also have leslie tracy um that's listening mm -hmm. in but yeah i believe that the city kind of leads that but on ncdot roadways i mean we have to coordinate with them kind of get the approval so yeah 
Um, I'll in sort of uh, in respect of time, we'll wrap up, but I'll uh, just plug a couple quick things that I wanted to take note of. Trisha Sh um, Shmara is not here. She, uh, but she visits often and, and has talked about getting sidewalks uh, to schools outside of city limits, but inside of the Durham County, right? It's just something that I want to make sure that is brought up here today. And it sounds like you're nodding, you're aware of that concern of like, where does the money for those sidewalks come from? Uh, we've been curious to hear that as well, because they should be built. Um, and then I'll, I'll throw in like, thank you, Kristen, for being here. And, uh, and I love the sort of, um, the idea of surveying these schools and sort of getting an understanding of how, what the behaviors are like currently. I'd love sort of longer term for there to be some sort of, um, you know, end of year, like summary of what we think is the sort of state of walking and biking hmm. to schools, right? Like you might not have enough detailed numbers for every school, but maybe there's some idea that we could, I'd love to see in five years, you know, are we trending in the right direction, right? Because we totally know that these things don't happen overnight, but in five years or 10 years, do we have, did we go from 10% walking to 12 to 14 to 20? You know, I'm throwing numbers. I don't know these numbers, of course, but uh, that's something we're that, starting okay. at 5%. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah, you knew that one, right? So <laughs> there you go. Optimism. Um, but yeah, you know, that's sort of something that, uh, and to make sure we're not trending in the wrong direction, of course. Um, so that's my plug, but um, yeah, we'll leave I it there. I love the end of the year mm -hmm. summary idea and quickly, if, yeah. how, how do you want to hear from me in, I might not be able to attend every meeting. I know that, you know, it would be a while before I would have like a presentation slot again, but is there like a written up? I mean, what, are there any other partners or mm -hmm. uh, agencies that you work with that, that where you have like a more um, structured check-in or report out or anything? And if you don't have an answer now, just know that I'm open to that. If you mm -hmm. want to figure out what that looks like um, beyond just like an end of the year summary, which I would like to do that for my own job. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's a good question. I, we don't have anything like really structured with any, I mean, city council and county, and the board of county commissioners are the ones that we get every every month, hopefully to come in, but, and hear updates, but maybe, um, I mean, via Bike Durham is something that we, since we coordinate with them, like giving updates to Bike Durham is a way for us that we can at least have a bridge there. Um, okay. But uh, we're also hoping to improve our sort of email communication outside of the commission. So uh, there might be sort of, if you're sending a quarter, you know, if you have quarterly updates, we'd we'd have a place where you could send them and then maybe uh, or yearly updates or whatever. Um, but maybe we'll also make sure that you're included in our sort of outreach cadence. So you can always just kind of follow up to that. But yeah, it's something I'll know. I don't think we have anything formal right now. Okay. Yeah, we have an email listserv that's just uh, BPAC members. So could always kind of just be sent through that. Or if you send it to me, I can send it out to the group, at least for right now. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And then also for the sake of time, um, just want to note that it's 813. Yes. Thank you, Hannah. All right. Well, Kristen and uh oh, was I sharing the, the whole time? time? Has... Sorry. No, that's all right. Yeah. Um thank you again, Kristen. Oh, and and uh I think Jeff and Aspen were maybe typing some thoughts, but uh Aspen just throws in that Club Boulevard feels very unsafe to cross, and most of the families I know with kids live more central in the neighborhood, so Lavender is a more direct route, um, noting that. Um, all right. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for being yeah, here. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. No, don't be a stranger. As you, whenever you can, feel free to join, and we'll definitely have you back soon. Um, okay. I'll, uh, and then, of course, you're welcome to stay on, or uh, have a good night, and uh, hopefully you're bedtime went well with the family um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully you'll right, find thanks. out soon <laughs> thanks yeah. um Bye. all right so let me just a quick note for the we have plenty of new members so uh i try to read out loud um questions and comments like that are relevant to the whole group just to make sure that you know anyone with different sort of accessibility needs gets a chance to sort of uh keep up with the conversation so sometimes you'll hear me repeating things that were already read so that that's the reason for that okay um and then may i see your questions i'll bring it up we'll discuss that at the udo portion which is in um announcements and updates all right let's move to the committee reports uh suzanne with triple e 
All right. I'll do my best to keep it brief so we can make up some time. Uh, so Triple E met last week and we had great attendance with some of our community representatives. So thanks to you folks who helped get those people engaged. And at the table, we had about 16 folks other than us or include about 17, including all, you know, some, a couple of BPAC members as well. Got some really good input about the walk audit uh, presentation that's been being developed for quite some time now. And uh, that's shared in the update. So if you're wondering what we're talking about, you're new and you're like, what, what is this? It is in the Google file. So you can take a look at that and uh, ask any Dennis, myself or Hannah, any questions. We'll be happy to make sure you're connected to that. Um, we had some next steps for that, but most folks, the community members were on board with uh, some of the suggestions in that PowerPoint in terms of some recommendations, but we still want to get some input from some of the business members and gain their input as well. So we're working on some getting some questions together and seeking out some input from some of the members uh, from the community there as well. And then refining the slides, resharing them with the group. And then what we were thinking is it would be nice to go back out with at least um, our city council and county commissioner representatives to do another walk audit based and noting the comments that were made. Um, it'd be great to have additional City Council and County Commissioner representatives, but at the minimum, we'd love to have our representatives. So we're hoping to coordinate that in the near future as well. Um, that pretty much took up all of our time, so we didn't have a chance to discuss other things. I know Hannah P. and Andres were not, Hannah had to leave early. They were hoping to give a social media update, but they're going to hold on that until December. So, um, and then the only other item was the community events, the holiday ride is December 9th that Bike Derm coordinates. So hopefully folks from BPAC will join that ride again. It's always a good time. I know Mike and I love to put on our Jingle Bell socks and go out there and toot the whole bike horn. So we'd love to have some other folks join us as well. <laughs> um, but uh, anybody's welcome and bite your neighbors. I've sent an email out to my neighborhood listserv folks to see if anybody wants to join. It's great for kids. It's a slow ride. It's really more like a bike walk kind of thing, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, so I hope people will sign up for that. And I'll put a link to it in the chat. Take any questions? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I also, I mean, Suzanne, um, I'll also, um, uh, Aspen's on the call, so I just want to know, I, I owe her the business, the questions we want to ask the businesses there. So we'll, we'll do that within a few days. Suzanne, did you, um, would you send that maybe through the, the BPAC listserv, just the internal one, any information on the event? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Do you want me to put it in the chat too, or just send it out to the listserv? Um, either way. Yeah. Just for other members. I can do both. Kind of see yep. It. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I forget who's next. Uh, Deborah, Scott. Scott. Yep. Thanks, Dennis. So Deborah, I've met a couple of Thursdays ago and we had four development plans this week. And just a quick summary, I'm trying to just sort of give you an idea of um, where the developments are being requested. And we typically ask for a lot of the same things, uh, multi-use paths or sidewalk frontage, bike lanes if it's appropriate, um, crossing, uh, raised crosswalks, uh, and so on. But um, the first one uh, Landon did, it's uh, Lee Village Center. And it was a text only, so not very many details. And it's between Falcon Bridge Road and George King Road off of Farrington, um, so between Durham and Chapel Hill. 86 acres, and it is going to be up to 4,100 residential units. So very big development, a lot of interior roads, and even some of the uh, roads around it are going to be rerouted. But in the text development plan, they're already agreeing to uh, multi-use paths and some sidewalks and also two internal greenways. So it's a big, big project and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that one. Next one, um, Brian reviewed a Mineral, Mineral Springs townhouses. Again, this one was text only. It's 10 acres on Mineral Springs Road and it has uh, 58 townhomes that are planned. And the things that we asked for on that one were protected bike lane on Mineral Springs Road, uh, sidewalk on the frontage, and there's a street Delmar that um, we asked for a pedestrian crossing. Another one that we looked at, actually I looked at was 302 Maureen Road. And that one was only half an acre where the developer wants to just put six um, small houses. And this is uh, on Maureen Road uh, near Whitfield, a little bit north of 147 and 15501 intersection. 
and uh, it also is very close to a city bike and ped project on Maureen Road, which is going, they've been working on for a while. We'll be starting construction, I think next year. And so we asked for a multi-use path along the part that uh, intersects Maureen. And there's another development that's going to, that is already there near the east. And uh, we asked for a connection to it uh, with a mid-block crossing. A lot of these two, we also ask for uh, curb radii that are favorable for, you know, less than uh, 10 feet, so favorable for um, pedestrians. Uh, the next one, uh, Lineley townhouses. Marissa reviewed this one. It's 12 acres and 102 townhouses. It's between I-885 and Ellis Road, so sort of northeast Durham, and uh, similar kinds of comments. We wanted a multi-use path on the Ellis frontage. Uh, there's an adjacent development. We want a connection to that and also curb radii. So those are the four that we did. Um, a lot of the same kinds of requests and a lot of development happening in Durham. And uh, most of it is uh, townhomes or, you know, sort of infill kind of development. Uh, also in the meeting, we uh, Dennis took us through the UDO update that's happening. And so we just started looking at some of the, you know, questions and schedule for, for the UDO, but there's a lot more to a lot more to come on that. So that's it. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Mike with Pi. Sorry, trying to type fast enough to keep up with Scott. Um, so we had, we spoke about Woodcroft Parkway first. The uh, public comments were due on November 3rd and our meeting was November 2nd. So we got them in right, right at the deadline. We had some suggestions for that and turned those in. Uh, Nathan had attended the Vision Zero conference and he provided some uh, takeaways from that, uh, including uh, discussed a little bit of World Day of Remembrance. I think we have listed later on in the meeting. Um, did mention that NCDOT had some spot safety funding and vulnerable road user funding available that could be applied for, uh, which would be interesting. Um, we went through the UDO recommendations, discussed some additional things to add there, and idea was brought up to review the Raleigh and Charlotte street plan maps to you know, potentially as a project come up with some proposals for Durham in future meetings. That's probably a bigger project though that we would have to tackle, but could be good. That's all, Mike, right? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, we don't have Javiera with us tonight, uh, but Heidi with the county, any updates for us? No, I'm trying to... mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. I'm trying to bake a pie at the same time. <laughs> I don't have any updates tonight. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Heidi. Appreciate it. Good luck with the pie. Um, also, anyway, I stum I stumbled into listening into the city council meeting last night. Uh, sounds like Javier was, anyway, had a late night last night and busy day today. So, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from that about maybe the fallout of that next month. Um, I think some of it is relevant to us, but uh, we won't get into that today. Nathan with Duke. Um, not a lot happening at Duke. The uh, consultants, Alta, are still looking through the survey result data and the map data, and they're supposed to give recommendations by late fall, is what the thing said. So by December 21st, because <laughs> that's when fall ends. Um, so hopefully they meet their deadline and they tell make some recommendations. Um, David Bradway and I keep bothering Mark Hugh and some other people about it every now and then being like, hey, have they said anything? Hey, what's going on? Anything? Anything new? Um, so hopefully they just actually tell us when there's development so we don't have to seek them out, but we'll see. Um, also, there's a group of students called OUF, uh, Our Urban Future, that did a sort of... Um, protest demonstration bike lane on campus drive using some chalk paint 
to um, uh, demonstrate to Duke University how wide a bike lane is supposed to be on a portion of Campus Drive where there's, so Campus Drive, there's like, there's a bike lane for a little bit and then it goes away and becomes nothing and then it comes back. And so they did a little bit there. Um, and that's basically it that's happening at Duke. Do you remind us what the uh, consultant was hired for? Uh, yeah, sorry. So they were hired to find five to seven uh, improvements for biking and walking on the campus to actually bring to, there was a comprehensive bike ped plan made in 2017 for Duke University. Um, and there hasn't been a lot that's actually happened with that. Um, and so they're like being brought in to find like five to seven smallish wins to then try, the hope is that to then get momentum to then make the ball actually move and make things actually happen. Makes sense. Thanks, Nathan. Um, no and yeah, Royal, so we do these sorts of updates um, from our uh, respective organizations. If you have anything relevant to biking and walking at North Carolina Central, we'd love to hear uh, any updates on your end or just uh, any sort of observations. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no updates uh, to give, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, great, Royal. Thanks. Um, and oh, yeah, Jeff, right. So for the first time, we'll make might do a DOS, the Open Space and Trails Commission, uh, inter-commission update. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything, or what's DOS up to these days? Anything that uh, you'd like to share? Um, nothing that um, particularly um, impacts um, uh, BPAC. Um, DOS is kind of focused right now on open space as opposed to trails. Interesting. I think one of the things that we'll talk about and maybe with maybe at a DevRev meeting is like whether we can integrate them into our development review process, because I think they I'm sure they're interested in the when they're there, there trails, is there's right? um there's certainly interest um on DOST of, of getting more involved in the DevRev um aspect. Um because certainly that would be input to get easements or um, things in place to connect to future trails. Maybe we can include them on an email for the invite for the next DevRev meeting so they can listen in at least and see what we're up to. Does that make sense? You know, sense, I think that's a um, um, that's a terrific um, suggestion, and uh, you know, I'll bring that up to the to the DOS folks. Uh, they don't have a meeting in December, um, so um, it would be at least January. For the new year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, any other? Community updates. Um, trying to think if I, I guess, kind of relevant to what the uh, Triple E meeting right before the Triple E meeting, um, Bike Durham and John and Talmadge at Bike Durham and put that, put together a bit of a sort of community, uh, sort of community oriented meeting about North Roxboro and Mangum streets and Duke and Guess streets and the idea of potentially two-waying those streets which are currently one way in each you know, Roxborough and Mangum are one way north south um uh between downtown and, and I-85 um so the idea of two-waying them but also talking about north Roxborough above or north of uh, I-85 uh, which is what we which is where our walk audit was and where we've been focused on so we had a community meeting there that sort of bled it. it was just two days before the triple e meeting so i think a lot of folks came from that community meeting to our triple e meeting uh, a couple of days later sort of hearing about it there so that was just uh good to sort of see um that kind of community engagement um but uh and then world day of remembrance i know was sunday um i think uh nathan and mary rose were able to make it out there any updates from that from you all um i i cried instead of giving an actual statement and uh as like the BPAG representative um I introduced myself and then completely started crying so that was good um but then it, there was like a small turnout it was my first time going to one of these so I, I don't really have a comparison from before but um uh we had quite a few speakers uh Sean Egan spoke and somebody from uh, the district's office at NCDOT also spoke um, and then just a few other like local representatives, but, um, I think overall it was good. We had a candle light vigil and, um, 
yeah, I think, I don't, I don't know, really, don't really have another update than that, but mm -hmm. overall yeah, it was I, a nice event. Thanks. Yeah, I put you on the spot, but I appreciate that. No, it's um, okay. Thanks for being there. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for sharing. Yeah. And thanks for being there on behalf of the commission. Um, I think generally, and, and Mary Rose thinks a lot about this, I know, uh, we, we think about these events also as opportunities like to, I mean, for lack of a better term, but like intervention or any action that we can take, right? It's not just about remembrance, but it's also about how can we sort of put those sort of the ideas or those sort of, um, yeah, put these ideas to actual implementation and action. So that intersection, um, Fayetteville and Cornwallis, you know, is one that we have sought, we have Mary Rose discussed, you know, a fair amount of thoughts about that with a few folks. And uh, generally, just for new members to be aware, you know, if there's an event happening or if there's um, things that you think, you know, we should consider taking, you know, we should make this intersection, we should improve the bike sort of um, lane at this cross, you know, at this uh, at this corridor or this intersection. Those are the things that I want sort of for folks to be able to bring up and sort of include each other. And we can try to take action, um, even if it's just in these sort of uh, small incremental ways. Anyway, thank you. I'll uh, move on. Hold on. I was going to say, um, yeah, go ahead. We did actually end up not having it at Fayetteville and Cornwallis. We had it at oh. um, Elmira Park. Um, I guess just issues with trying to reserve that location at Fayetteville and Cornwallis. But mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, there was a person in our community who was crossing the street, I want to say back in May, um, who at the Cornwallis and Fayetteville intersection were. Uh, Beachwood Cemetery is and he was hit by a car um, that just didn't see him so um, I believe it's his aunt um, sort of helped lead the World Day of Remembrance ceremony that we had on Sunday yeah thanks Mary Rose one one quick one uh, Dennis uh, at the movable city uh, BPAC had a table uh, this was a couple Saturdays ago, and Nathan and I worked, and we had, uh, it was a beautiful day. Um, we had very good uh, kind of visits to the table, and a lot of people interested in what BPAC does, and um, so anyway, just uh, getting the word out there. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay, um, the next item is uh, the presentation topic, so I'll, I'll throw them up here. This is old business. Um, just uh, <clears throat> especially as we're getting into the holidays, if folks have uh, ideas for future presentation topics for BPAC, um, be uh, interested to hear them, especially new members. Maybe you have connections or um, thoughts that aren't sort of that we haven't thought of before. So if you have any ideas for, we like to bring folks from Durham or government or organizations that can uh, we can learn from and, and hear about what's going on uh, in and around Durham. Um, I think, yeah, so the Safe Routes to School was really quite interesting. And I, I think you make having Kristen come back, you know, not, you know, it doesn't have to be once a year, right? I think having her come back more frequently would be really great, uh, in my opinion. Um, but any other uh, suggestions or maybe things we can eliminate from this list? Um, I do have a suggestion to add yeah. uh, updates about the reimagined Durham Freeway. Mm, yeah. um, that'll be undergoing in 2024 as well as um, receiving information uh, around the Fayetteville Street and Holloway transit corridor since they will be working on design for improvements along those corridors. So I would welcome that. Um, I also know that next year they will likely be uh, downtown Durham Incorporated will be doing a master plan. So it'd be good to hear about that in 2024 as well. Downtown Durham Incorporated. Interesting. Thanks, Ideal. Yeah, those are good ideas. Um, that makes me think of two things. One is uh, the consultant we'll talk about with UDO, uh, reg with regards to the UDO. I don't see why, if they have the time and they're interested in learning from the Durham, sort of engaging with the Durham community, uh, why they wouldn't be willing to maybe come talk to us directly uh, on BPAC about their plans for the new UDO. Um, and then um, one thought was, 
I know we, we have a fair amount of concern or like generally, and these are about re related to May's question or, um, as well uh, about the bike walk sort of implementation plan. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's some sort of update we can get on that. I think there was some, maybe Hannah, you know, or don't, I don't know, but uh, about some plan to sort of update that bike walk implementation plan, if I recall, is that right? Yes, so that's a joint effort now with um, the county, and then it's kind of being facilitated with the MPO. Um, Brian Taylor is the project manager on that, but we are just starting to kick off that, but I think it would be definitely a good topic um, to kind of have a, a meeting presentation on, but yeah, right now there's nothing to really share, but I think, sure. yeah, in the future. Yeah, maybe that's a good one for early or spring, early next year or spring. Um, any other thoughts? I see uh, Mary Rose in the chat. Uh, something that could be a good presentation would be how to improve safety at crosswalks through things like daylighting, which aren't directly traffic calming, but they make the intersections more visible so that drivers can see pedestrians before they cross the street. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. So this is like, <laughs> uh, don't intrude on the roadway. Maybe these are low-hanging fruit, right? Daylighting, things that we can do that don't have to go through transportation or through NCDOT. That's a great idea. Um, I wonder if there's anybody, any organization that has ideas about that. I'd be happy to hear that. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I've only seen like where where people have been doing that in other cities. So it could be mm. possible to reach out to like I mean, who they were talking to, but I don't know anybody locally. Um, yeah. I just know that it's like one of the strategies that I believe it's it's either Hoboken or Jersey City or maybe both. Um, it's like one of their strategies and how they're reaching Vision Zero. And I always can't remember which city it is, but one of them hasn't had uh, any deaths or serious injuries in the last four years. And part of that is due to their daylighting at intersections. Hmm. I think and it's yeah, for people who don't know what daylighting is, it's basically like you're creating this sort of buffer, like an artificial buffer, or even sometimes a real one around the intersection so that that the view for cars is like they have a wider angle so that they can see farther out um, and therefore know if there's a pedestrian there, as opposed to like a lot of sidewalks um, and especially like downtown areas they might have, um, or not sidewalks, a lot of streets might have like on-street parking that goes up to the crosswalk. And so if you're a car and you're approaching the street that uh, you can't see a pedestrian because a car is blocking them. And so to daylight that intersection would be to not allow uh, car parking, at least like a car's length um, before the crosswalk, just to make it more visible to a car that's coming, that there's somebody standing at the at the corner yeah yeah that's a good idea i think that also reminds me of i think we brought this up at some point recently but um raleigh um doing some of their spot safety improvements i think it was was it sean sean or shane i think there might be two folks actually but raleigh, in raleigh but they're um <clears throat> have some planners that are focusing on kind of finding these spot safety um in projects uh kind of that ncdot can approve and will fund. Uh, not that daylighting directly relates to that, but we're like this sort of off the right of way improvements directly relate to that, but that's just another one, maybe talking with the folks in Raleigh about their um, strategies. Okay. So you all, like what one would you want to pursue for next month? Because these were a lot of really great ideas, but I'm wondering like, do you actually want to have a, a speaker for next month um, or? And if you do, which ones would you want to pursue? Does anyone have any connections to any of the um, people? Normally, try to start that process within like the next week to try to secure someone. So, is there anything that kind of is at the top of the the list of who you'd want to hear from, and that someone has maybe a contact with? Good question. I but maybe it's a good moment, and I I think. The folks in Raleigh are one that I can immediately contact. I know I have the email of the one person, um, but yeah, I'm happy to hear from okay. others if they have a priority. I think the reimagined Durham Freeway, we definitely should hear about, but I don't know if that's at a stage yet where they would 
have much to talk about the ideal I don't know if you know otherwise no um reimagined journal would be probably better by spring quarter two mm -hmm. um yeah. and same on if not quarter three for like the transit yeah quarter three for like the transit emphasis corridors mm -hmm. Suzanne you have your hand raised well I was just wondering if December might be a good time to hear from like some previous BPAC members as we go into the new year to hear some thoughts on either re from recent members too who you know have transitioned off or like oh man we, you know I wish I could still have helped with this project or if they have recommendations um, maybe some folks who've transitioned off even further down you know more in the latter distant part mm -hmm. of the past or whatever and who might have some recommendations or ideas but just to hear from a few folks that might be willing to share perspectives of feedback participation priorities lessons learned things that they hope we'll consider as we keep moving forward that kind of thing i also yeah. want to suggest that if we want to do that in person there's a lovely local venue with bike racks and a sidewalk and it's transit accessible and it's in my neighborhood. And if we wanted to take a look at these railroad tracks that the county's eventually going to do a study on about pedestrian safety over the railroad tracks, I'm happy to walk you down there to see what that mm -hmm. looks like down there. It'll be pitch dark, but I'm happy to do it. <laughs> and there's probably, and, and maybe I could swing some barbecue for that meeting. Maybe that's something mm -hmm. for even like the retreat, if that's a location, because mm -hmm. that's something yeah, on that, the agenda. That, we need that location is excellent. I just held an event there and I, you can easily fit 30, 40 people in there. The lighting is really good and there's no up and down an elevator or stairs. And it's really easy to get into the space and recognize that you're in the right place. And I think that helps when you're, we're trying new venues, it gets frustrating. Um, but yeah, whether we do it as a retreat or for a meeting, um, it is, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? It's called the raw edition candle company, but she uses the space for like candle making classes and also rents it out for all kinds of stuff. It's on um, Driver Street at 304 South Driver Street. Now you mentioned barbecue, but you didn't say whether it's Eastern or Lexington it's, style. It's, listen, it's always, <laughs> that, don't, don't play with me. It's Mike D's barbecue. I say it with my chest out. Mike D's barbecue and it's mm. down the street from the location. So he's about a, two blocks away, which makes it really easy for him to deliver without much fuss. Yeah, I think I'll that would something be. Something for those who don't eat the barbecue. <laughs> there are non-meat veggie sides. Okay. So beans, slaw, um, I think corn, potato salad, et cetera, and a roll and sweet tea All and right. lemonade or natural sodas. Yeah, I did. And I definitely turkey, chicken, you know, pork, and of course beef. You, you now I'm hungry. And mac and cheese. I forgot mac and cheese. Let's put that on the list for yeah um, the retreat. Can we actually let's take? A I love how here. quickly the tone of this conversation shifted. When yeah, I yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> you should have left this as the last agenda item for sure. Uh, and then me, after the meeting, we could just go down to the bar right. down the street and be like. Have have the next meeting 2.0. Me Hi, Heidi, you can come along. Come on, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, plus ones, everyone. Um, let's take a quick soft poll. Who can actually make the next meeting, which is uh, December 19th, um, which is pretty late in the game. So I just, yeah, maybe if hands I can. Um, or vocals. Sorry, did okay. you say can or cannot make it? How about this? Let, okay, I see a lot of hands up. Let's say who cannot make it. That's here. No. We have two that are maybe. We have one no. We have one maybe. Two maybe. Or two no's. One maybe. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like it's an immediate cancellation. I think we'll mm -hmm. move forward with this date then. Um, uh, because if we couldn't get a quorum, we need to sort of cancel it or change the date. Um. Mm -hmm. But okay, so we'll, we'll stick with this date. I'll happily watch the recording, but the 19th okay. is deep cut into my hibernation season, so. Sure, okay. Well, let's, uh, okay, so for next month, I like actually Suzanne's plan because it might also give us, 
because I think we're going to have a, we're going to have to vote on new chairs and do a, a few things. Yeah. So it might be good to have a slightly less heavy meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we can invite a few of our former members um, to join. Um, and then, yeah, let's talk about let's let's defer the conversation for uh, in, in person. Well, we'll, we have a sort of agenda item for that, I guess. Um, but so I guess. Sort of, yeah, go ahead. Hannah. Well, just going back to that. So I guess, Suzanne, do you want to help lead of finding the members we want to speak um, at the next meeting? Or I'm just wondering, like, what's kind of the action item for that? Um, and like, are there specific members just with the holidays, like everyone's out and stuff. So if this is something we want to do, I want to make sure we know the direction we're going yeah in. um i mean honestly it, it would be a little bit hard for me except thinking about people who recently transitioned transitioned off like dan and i'm trying to okay. like others that people might i mean it'd probably be helpful for folks who've been here for a bit maybe to share a couple of names that might be good just to help trigger the memory mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know My, i don't yeah, know if Mike emily would have any interest in coming back or not um emily mm -hmm. was on here for a while um it might be not to, to, uh, to, uh, to dale What's that? Sorry? It might be um, worthwhile to reach out to Dale McKeel. Um, well, I was going to mention that, and then there's part of me, it's like, or does he want us to leave him alone for a bit? <laughs> well, he you know, he probably could name 50 former, former members off the top mm -hmm. of his head. Um, yeah. So, oh, you, you mean know, for not so member ideas, him not to, for him. To be there, but, you know, he would know um, dozens of people. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe we could send an email to Dale and Dan and Mike, the folks who recently transitioned off that we know have been on for a while, and and ask if they're interested or if they know of others. Trisha yeah, Swar might be uh, a possibility because yeah. she's she's engaged still, but she's been off for a while. She, yeah, she did have a That's child a idea. Just, just recently. I think that might be. Oh yeah, I think she just had a oh, yeah. kid like this week or something. <laughs> Um, oh, but okay. An email doesn't hurt. Is that okay so, with you, Hannah? Is that a good? Yeah, good yeah. Let's just coordinate outside of this. Um, okay. A bit more. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Um, all right. I think we knocked off a couple of these other items already, but um, <clears throat> I'll speak to the sort of new business. We have chair and vice chair nominations. So next month, uh, we will need to vote on new chair and vice chair. And um, we, I, we have, I haven't heard from folks if anyone's interested, so you're always welcome to still reach out, uh, but I'll be meeting with the uh, sort of committee chairs um, in the next week or two. Well, I, we know it's early December um, to start reaching out to you all about the, the roles. So um and, and new members also. I know some of you just joined today or today's your first meeting, but um, I think it was Ideal who nominated me for vice chair like three, two meetings in. So um, it, it everyone's welcome. Anyone uh, who, and you, you've seen today what it takes to be chair. It's just, you gotta try not to run super late. That's about it. Um, but if you have any sort of questions about the role, and we've been thinking about ways to make it sort of divide up the work a little bit between the different roles, but um, we haven't formalized that and the new the sort of new roles, uh, the new folks who take on the roles can sort of, arbit sort of be the arbiters of those changes. But um, feel free to reach out. And if not, we'll be reaching out to some of you in the next couple of weeks, just FYI. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, the 2024 meeting schedule, we don't have to finalize it today, but we do need to finalize it in December. And so maybe Hannah, I don't know if you have a uh, draft or if not, we should make sure we send it out before the December meeting. Um, anything you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was gonna say um, the city clerk's office was asking for it to be due by the second. Um, so, but I mean, I can ask for like an extension and stuff, but um, yeah, I wasn't really sure like how you all voted on it in the past, but I was assuming it would kind of just stay the same of like the third Tuesday of the month and then kind of the same with like the committee ones. Um, again, like this week was definitely not an ideal meeting time, I would say, for most people, um, but it seems like that's something that could be voted on in like a previous meeting of, you know, if an actual date needs to be adjusted. Um, so I guess... Yeah, if there's anyone that has strong opinions on it, 
um, if you want to speak up now. If not, we can kind of just go with the same kind of uh, meeting schedule. So, the, yeah, the noteworthy thing is that it's the third Tuesday of every month, um, 7 to 9 p.m., except for July is usually the month we take off. So if folks today have a thought about it shouldn't be July, it should be a different month, you can bring that up. Um, I haven't looked at November or December in 2024, right? Um, but yeah, any other, any thoughts or, or sort of initial concerns? Well, I know we talked at one point about possibly having at least a couple of in-person meetings just to kind of mm -hmm. help help with the yeah. connection aspect. Um, I don't know if that's yeah. something yeah. that's still, if that's something we're going to discuss at a later meeting. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because, yeah, we would have to give the Zoom like recording link and, yeah, say what ones are in person, hybrid or whatever. Yeah, I think the dates, if I'm not misunderstanding, the dates we need to settle for sure. And then we can change the form. I mean, we could change the dates, too, as long as we have to do it in advance. But um, as long as we have a tentative schedule, we can kind of definitely, we should definitely revisit the in-person meetings. I think I'll, I'd like to sort of ideally we separate those conversations so we can get this, the dates in whenever they need it. Dennis, one thing um, that DOST recently decided is to have um, one meeting a quarter in person <laughs> to not totally get rid of Zoom because, you know, it's convenient for people, but to have four meetings a year where it'd be in person to just, you know, that, that bonding people get to meet each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about something similar, but then I think we also talked about daylight savings time and maybe trying to have the in-person meetings when it's not dark at five. <laughs> Mary Rose, go ahead. Yeah, I have two points. Um, one of which is that Thanksgiving next year is <clears throat> not the same week as our meeting. Um, so that's not an issue for next year. And I checked Christmas as well. Um, but uh, we are running late or not quite running late on time, but we might need to ask yeah. for more time um, yeah. to finish this discussion because we also haven't gotten to May's questions yet. Yeah, and the UDO discussion is, is sort of with, with regards to May's questions. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up though. Um, <clears throat> why don't we uh, pause this discussion? It looks like we don't have a big issue with the dates off the top of our heads for next year. Um, if you need to submit them, actually, I mean, it, I'm. if you don't mind emailing to us, I don't know if we have to vote on it, but Hannah, if you know we have to vote on it, then we have to wait until next month. If we don't have to vote on it, I'm okay with third Tuesdays, except for July. And if folks have an issue, feel free to mention it. Is that fine, Hannah, for now? Yeah, I mean, do you guys want to just do like a tentative vote, just in case? I don't see why we would need a vote if we're not changing what has know. been our meeting schedule for at least 15 years okay yeah yeah perfect i'd, I'd like to see the, yeah yeah i mean i guess yeah we could take a motion anyone can start a motion but um i'm okay also with just That's waiting fine. until december yeah if you're willing um just let us know hannah if, you, if we do need a vote when you hear back yeah, I'll just, yeah, I'll let them know that it's going to stay the same. We're talking through about the in-person times um, and we'll keep them posted on that. But yeah, we'll post the 2024-25 schedule mm -hmm. online. Okay, I'll move to May's questions. Um, and thanks, May. I think you're, are you still here? I think you are. But um, anyway, in any case, uh, they are important questions because May has been an advocate for this sort of missing sidewalk um, near her community for a while. Um, I do think that the, the two points you bring up I kind of are the sort of two action items that we've discussed, which are, one is in general, what do we do about payment in lieu? And that's related to the UDO discussion. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Hannah, I skipped one item, but we'll get to that at the end. Um, and then the do other you, is- um, Do you need to add more time? Yeah, I yeah, I think we could add five minutes. I don't think it's gonna be long. If anyone would start a motion for five minutes. I move to add five minutes to this meeting. Second. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. All opposed? Okay. Not hearing, seeing anything. Thanks all. 
Um, the payment in lieu discussion, I think, is looped into the UDO discussion. Um, and so uh, we will continue to give updates on the UDO improvements or sort of update process. Um, and then the um, specifically how we prioritize our sidewalks, that's to me is related to this bike and walk um, implementation plan. And so I think out of that, May, I'm hoping that we do get an updated list of new sidewalks, or at least an updated list of all the sidewalks that are in sort of priority list uh, and including the sidewalk, because I know your sidewalk that you specifically are concerned about has not been added to any of these lists. So um, sort of putting a sort of note here that I think these are the two things, the UDO update and the bike walk uh, implementation plan are the things we will keep an eye on. And so please do keep coming back and checking in on those, especially when we have um, Brian come in and talk to us about the uh, bike walk. Uh, plan. Um, if folks have anything to add about the to May, feel free. Um, the UDO discussion more generally was one that I just wanted to sort of touch on, which is I went to a community sort of kickoff meeting with the consultant who's doing, who's leading the kind of UDO rewrites. Overall, I think sort of the takeaway is that I think this is an opportunity to do sort of put into policy a lot of the things we ask for in DevRev, right? So all these new developments coming in, we have to ask for uh, added width to this for a bike lane. Um, maybe ask them to do improvements to the nearby intersections. Ask them to keep speeds low inside their um, on their internal streets. So these are the things we ideally we would get into the UDO as much as is sort of legally possible. Um, but uh, mainly, I'm just going to throw out a um, sort of just a note that uh, if anyone is interested in taking on and sort of being kind of the person who keeps in tr keeps track of the UDO updates, it'll be at least, I think, a year-long process here. Um, but if anybody's interested in sort of being the kind of liaison for that process with BPAC and the consultant um, and the city of Durham, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I don't, um, it's just, maybe it's like going to one or two meetings with the UDO um, over the course of the next year and just keeping track of their email updates. Uh, but we will be keeping sort of email communication with them, is my understanding. Um, and we will be sending them sort of our recommendations uh, for what the new UDO should contain. And folks have gotten a chance to see them in the uh, committee meetings. Uh, but I'll send that out again, and we'll we'll do a sort of another round of those in December. Um, that's all I have on the UDO for now. Um, pause. We talked about the movable city participation. Thanks, Scott and Nathan, for doing that. And um, and the holiday social is kind of what we were talking about a little bit, but maybe first, Hannah, I know you wanted to ask about the, uh, I skipped the cultural orientation program, if you want to get into that. Yeah, I forgot also with the meeting schedule, um, if we could, I guess we probably won't have time now to, but for the retreat, we need to think about the weekend that we want to schedule that. Um, and we had, um, someone from the equity and inclusion department uh, reach out that they're trying to have it where all commission groups now receive every year a racial equity training. And so um, that is about 90 minutes. Um, it can be in person or it can be virtual, but um, she said that a lot of people are including it in their retreats. Um, and so she said she'd be willing to come if it's a Saturday and actually come in person. Um, but we kind of need to pin down a date that we would want to have our retreat. So then that kind of can be coordinated a bit more. Um, so I don't know, for the sake of time, I guess we can kind of talk more about that next month. But just know, yeah, we have to schedule a retreat for February time. I think we could send a sort of doodle or some sort for the weekends between our first and second meeting. That's when we did it last year, um, late January, early February mm -hmm. for those weekends. Um, we could send that out before next meeting so we can get a gauge of it. I've noted that. Okay. Um, and then the other thing was um, I had Lucas from the police department. He had reached out I guess the Durham Police Department, they work with the Church World Service to help resettle asylum seekers in the city and county. And I guess they started a cultural orientation program and they invite various agencies in um, to talk a little bit more about what the different um, 
programs do. And they were really interested in BPAC. Um, and they wanted to have someone from the commission come and kind of talk with um, the, the different people. And he said that they have um, presentations and um, they're hoping to get BPAC to come in sometime in January. Uh, I guess they meet with them on Wednesdays from 11 to 1230. And so um, they, yeah, they wanted one or two BPAC members to kind of come give you know an informal presentation talk a little bit about what BPAC does you know how it's helping you know um, push things forward so if anyone is interested in that I'd like to follow up with Lucas um, soon about that and either say yes or no um, but but yeah so I told him I was going to bring this up at the meeting and um, yeah if anyone has any thoughts around that let me know does anyone have any thoughts like right now or what was did you have a did you have a date and I missed it? Yeah, so it's it would be January 2024. Okay. Um and it's the Wednesdays. So the third, the tenth, seventeenth, okay. twenty-fourth, or thirty-first. And it's basically like during lunchtime on Wednesdays from eleven to twelve thirty. Um, which I know is like kind of hard for people who work. Um, which everyone works. So yeah, I mean, understandable if no one can, but that's just, they they were interested in BPAC and wanted to hear from you all, so. I am not yet sure if I'm available to participate, like to do that, but I do have the how to get around the city without driving um, document that I made for the week without driving. So that could be something that we share with them um it, it's like it's mostly for durham but it does extend into the triangle and some other areas of the state but that could be useful as like just something to give them it's just a google doc so yeah yeah it's a good idea did you say it was in in person or over zoom i think it's in person um yeah he made it seem like they kind of come in and meet with the the different groups that come to present and have the conversations. Like downtown Again, or I don't know. I was okay. just wondering if anyone is even interested. But if you are interested, um, then I can maybe connect you with Lucas. Yeah. Um, and just get more information in general. Yeah, maybe if you could get. If you have any more info or just send an email as well to mm -hmm. just one more prompt for us. But right now it might be kind of difficult aside from Mary's document. Thanks for mentioning that. All right. I'll tidy up here if that's fine, Hannah. Um, so I think that covers most things, the holiday social. And if anyone wants to sort of uh, take that on, I think there are a few of us who would be interested, but um, let me just, I'll know to send an email about that after, but, and we can start an email thread. Anything else folks want to add about that, the holiday social or, or meeting up in person this month or before the new year? I think it could be fun, but I also recognize that December's hard for a lot of people. So maybe even if it ends up going into January, mm -hmm. there's still holidays in January, we can still call it the holiday social. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Pre and post, whatever holiday you want. Um, yeah, I think we'll have opportunities and we'll start to engage that with those ideas more in the coming months. Um, all right, for communication priorities, uh, I have retreat timing. Um, I think we had a link, Suzanne, that you were going to send out. Um, uh, and the um, and maybe Hannah, if you want to follow up with the uh, uh, what we were just discussing with the meeting the, with the police department. Um, and anything else in terms of, I, I think I will send a UDO related sort of an update to that document soon. And I, the walk audit document as well, actually planning to update that before our next meeting, but not not uh, in the next two days. Any other communication priorities um, than the ones I just mentioned? Dennis, uh, reaching out to the city of Raleigh your contact for sure do you want to do just, that for December? i mean for future. no i mean even for yeah january february 
because I feel like it, it. a lot of people do get busy and so you kind of have to start conversations like now for them Good so call. I'll do that and then yeah I guess and then for December next panelists <laughs> yeah oh yeah December meeting yeah Suzanne we can get together on that on an email all right, uh, May followed up to the question uh, tonight. A few members said to Ms. Brookshire that tell us if we can help. In the last few months, no one had interest in any offer of assistance for the Ferry and Sidewalk Gap. Just an observation. Thank you for the UDO, et cetera. Hope it will not stay as talk, but action. Thank you, May. Yeah, I appreciate that. I know it's, yeah, appreciate your diligence. All right, anything else before we close tonight, folks? All right. Have a good night. Everyone. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, all. Bye, y'all. Good night, everybody. Bye.